I ask you now to please turn your Bibles with me to Galatians chapter 5. In our studies of the book of Galatians, we are now in chapter 5 and we shall focus on verses 1 to 11. Galatians 5, beginning our reading from verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. A little leaven, leaven the whole lamp of dough. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will adopt no other view. But the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. But if I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate or castrate themselves join our hearts to pray for the Lord's blessing as we consider his words our father we thank you for the richness of your kindness to us indeed your loving kindness is better than life itself and we ask and pray that as we again come to your words Lord it is our duty to become not dull of hearing. It is our duty to gird up the loins of our minds. And we pray that even as we do so, you would grant us the strength to do it, and that you would grant us the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to understand your word. Help us to feel the weight of it on our hearts. May your word come like a hammer that breaks, like a fire that burns. Destroy every remnant of false thinking, false belief. And Lord, we pray that your word would shape our thoughts and shape our view of things and shape the way we live. Hear us, we pray. Bless this word to our hearts. Do not leave us to our own, O God. Grant us the aid and power of the Holy Spirit to the end that, Lord, your word would truly profit our souls and your name will be glorified. Hear us, we pray, for these things we plead in Jesus' name. Amen. This portion of scripture read in your hearing is Paul Finals' argument and appeal to the churches of Galatia to remain faithful to the gospel message that they have heard and believingly embrace. They have embraced the gospel message preached by Paul, and they were in the process, but they were in the process of embracing another gospel by the Judaizers, a gospel which is not really the true gospel, but a 
distorted gospel. And here, Paul gives his final argument and appeal to the Galatians not to embrace that different gospel, but to remain true to the gospel message. And I hope all of us will pay attention to Paul's final word or final argument and appeal that we will have all eyes on our Bible and on the preacher and ears to hear. For although these words were first addressed to the churches in Galatia during the apostolic era, it was never meant just for those churches. The message in this letter is also addressed to all churches in any and every generation. As Christ's seven letters addressed to the seven churches in Asia Minor, which was written by an apostle, reminds us, he was an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Now, as we consider this passage, we shall do so under four headings. First, consider with me in the passage the call to stay free. The call to stay free. Verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. That's the call to stay free. Now note the ground of the call. Verse 1a, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Free. Freedom from what? Well, the context, both the previous as well as the succeeding, clearly indicates that Paul is referring particularly to the Mosaic Covenant. In itself, the Mosaic Covenant as a covenant could not really set anyone free. In fact, to those who did not have faith in Messiah under that covenant, it could only increase their bondage. And God instituted that covenant in order to point people to their desperate need of Messiah, whom God promised would come in order to accomplish redemption for God's people. As we have seen from Galatians 3 and verse 21, Paul writes, verse 23, Is the law then contrary to the promise of God? May it never be. For if the law has been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would have been based on law. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin, so that the promise by faith in Christ might be given to those who believe. Verse 26, Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. For in itself, the giving of the Ten Commandments by special revelation could only increase man's liability to punishment. Moreover, the multiplicity of rules and regulations that were merely ceremonial and temporary under the Mosaic Covenant were very restrictive and childish or even infantile. As clear from Galatians 4 and verse 9 to 10. 
But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? You observe days and months and seasons and years. You are very restricted. And even the provisions of the animal sacrifices instituted by God under the Mosai covenant could not really effectively take away sin. It could only provide external or ceremonial cleansing, not internal cleansing. And it could only serve the purpose of pointing people to their desperate need of a much better sacrifice that would effectively take away sin. The sacrifice that Messiah himself will offer once and for all. In the language of Galatians 3 and verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Those animal sacrifices that pointed to that could not really effectively deal with sin and satisfy the claims of God's law. And they only pointed to the need of a much better sacrifice that Messiah will bring when he will die upon the cross of Calvary in order to effectively take away and atone for sin. Now, Christ came in order to accomplish redemption and free us from all Of those things. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Free. Free from what? Free particularly from the Mosaic covenant, which could not make anyone free but could only increase their bondage. Christ came in order to accomplish redemption and free us all from that. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. He did not free us from bondage only to be in bondage again. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Now that is the ground of the call. Then note the content of the call. Verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm. And do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Observe that this is a matter of duty. It is a Christian's duty to persevere resolutely in the freedom that Christ has given him or her against every effort to bring him or her again to a yoke, to a yoke of slavery. This yoke of slavery was the yoke of slavery that the Judaizers were trying to impose on the churches of Galatia. And Paul broadens the expression so as to include any form of slavery, including the yoke of paganism which Gentile Galatians once bore. <coughs> Seasons, years, all of those obligations, the Mosaic covenant, the circumcision, the dietary laws. 
It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Then, if that is so, it is your duty to persevere resolutely in that freedom. Even if it means death. You must resist any and every effort to bring you again into bondage. Whether that bondage be of Jewish origin, pagan origin, or whatever origin, it must be resisted resolutely. For Christ set you free so that you will be free, not that you will again be in bondage. Now that's the call to stay free. But then notice secondly in the passage the cause of not staying free. What's the cause of not staying free? It's all or nothing. Verse 2, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. That's the cause of not staying free. Note that here Paul puts the churches the dilemma. On the one hand, you have circumcision as needful for justification, being right with God and acceptance with God. And on the other, you have Christ and Christ alone for your justification, for your acceptance with God. Here Paul denies the possibility of ever combining the two. The two are mutually exclusive. You cannot mix them up. You either have one or the other. Circumcision as needful for justification and Christ and Christ alone for your justification. Those are the only two options. You either have the one or the other. You cannot have both. Only one or the other. Now the issue here is not circumcision as such as though it was wrong in itself or prohibited in itself. No. Paul even had Timothy circumcised so that he can mix with the Jews and evangelize them, Acts 16 verse 3. But Paul is referring to circumcision as if it were a ground of our acceptance with God, our justification and our acceptance with God. As Paul later says in verse 4, you have been severed from Christ you who are seeking to be justified by law. And there it refers particularly to circumcision. You have fallen from grace. It is the idea that Christians have to be circumcised in order that it will contribute to their justification and their acceptance with God. And Paul says, you either have the one or the other. Circumcision as needful for justification or contributing to your justification or Christ and Christ alone as the basis of your acceptance with God. You either have the one or the other. You cannot have both. And note how strongly worded 
is Paul's warning. He says in verse 2, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. That is, receive circumcision as if it were needful for your justification, needful for your or contributing to your justification. If you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And here Paul puts all the weight of his authority as an apostle in this statement. He says, Behold, I, Paul, say to you, that if you receive circumcision, that is as contributing to your justification, Christ will be of no benefit to you. To think that obedience to the law of circumcision would somehow contribute to our justification is to deny the all-sufficiency of Christ as the basis of our justification and to deny the all-sufficiency of Christ as the only basis of our acceptance with God is not to benefit from Christ. You either trust in Christ and Christ alone for your justification and acceptance with God or you do not trust in Him at all and He will not benefit you anything. It's all or nothing. If Christ, as one puts it, is supplemented then he is supplanted. For anyone to think, even in the least degree, that obedience to some law contributes to our justification and merits us the right to eternal life is to deny the gospel of grace and Christ will profit us nothing. It is either you trust in Christ alone or Christ will not profit you at all. See, it's like a man on a burning building with no other way out except to jump into a huge air balloon or air bag, whatever you call it, below. You either trust that the air bag will save you or you will not you will never jump off the building and the airbag will be of no benefit to you you can't have both you either cling to the burning building hoping that somehow you will not get burned or you'll jump off the burning building and trust that the airbag is sufficient to give you a safe fall. You cannot have both. The same is true when it comes to our justification. Our having a right standing with God. You either trust in Christ alone for justification or if you will not you will not profit from him at all the choice is clear and then note further how Paul puts it verse 3 again I testify to every man. He is not inventing this. He is testifying what he knows is true. He is a witness of the truth. And I testify again. This is not the first time 
He has been doing this. Testify. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision. That is as contributing to our justification. And I testify again to everyone who receives circumcision. That he is under obligation to keep the whole law. If circumcision were the basis of our justification and acceptance with God, then that would require submission to all the requirements and provisions of the Mosaic Covenant. You cannot be subject to a few that you think are doable No, you have to be subject to all. And that includes all the dietary laws of the Mosaic Covenant, which were external and temporal in nature, that which was never meant to last, all the regulations about washings and cleansing, a multitude of of instructions concerning those things. That includes all the animal and grain sacrifices, all the feasts and the festivities. Everything. You cannot just embrace circumcision and leave the rest. Pick and choose what you think are doable. You have to be subject to all. Apparently, the Galatian churches were not aware of this. They thought that they can be subject to some of the requirements of the Mosaic Covenant, but not all. But no, says Paul, if you subject yourself to one, you have to be subject to all. And isn't this the problem of many of those who still embrace those temporary rules and requirements peculiar only to the Mosai Covenant? There were laws that transcends the Mosai Covenant, yes. But those specific rules that were peculiar only to the Mosai Covenant, isn't that the problem what some embrace now, still embrace some of those dietary laws and they celebrate some of the feasts? But they say, but we can do everything. And Paul says, no. You can't just pick and choose. It's a whole system. If you want to be subject to one, you have to be subject to all. You can't pick and choose. It either, it's either you go all the way of becoming a Jew under the old covenant or you're not. And then Paul states it again in verse 4. Putting before them the cause. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Note the cause or consequence of seeking to be justified by law. You have been severed from Christ, or it could be translated, you get severed from Christ. And you have fallen from grace, or it could be translated, you get to fall from grace. That's the consequence. The cause or consequence of seeking to be justified by law, thinking that somehow obedience to the law will contribute to our justification, whatever that law might be, is devastating. It is to get severed from Christ alienated from Christ, severed, which means to be cut off from your relationship with 
Christ. It is to fall out of the position of grace. You either trust in Christ alone or you cannot have Christ at all. The choice is clear. And here, John Calvin commenting on this verse say and applies it to the Roman church whom he calls the papis. That's how they call it. What else do our modern puppies but trust upon us in place of circumcision, trifles of their own invention? No meet on Friday. And all of those various ceremonies and dates and church calendars. The tendency of their whole doctrine is to blend the grace of Christ with the merit of works, which is impossible. Whoever wishes to have the half of Christ loses the whole. And yet the papis think themselves exceedingly acute or wise when they tell us that they ascribe nothing to works except through the influence of the grace of Christ as if it were a different error from what was charged on the Galatians. They did not believe that they had departed from Christ or relinquished his grace. And yet they lose Christ entirely when that important part of evangelical doctrine was corrupted. Therefore, to keep standing firm in the freedom that Christ has set us free is crucial. Even if it means death, you have to stay free. It is an indispensable necessity. Never think that obedience to some law would somehow contribute to your justification. No! If you ever move in that direction, you lose Christ. You fall out of grace. You cannot have half of him. You must have the whole of him. You either jump off the burning building or you do not. You either trust the airbag below or you cling in to the building. And there is no salvation from the fire. It's all or nothing. That's the cause. But how can believers stay free? Well, having considered a call to stay free and the cause of not staying free, note thirdly in the passage the way to stay free. How can you stay free? Verses 5 and 6. Of Galatians 5, verse 5, For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. Note the first mention by Paul in verse 5. For we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. Now what is this hope of righteousness that believers are waiting for through the Spirit by faith? What is this? Well, in a real sense, believers are already in possession of this righteousness by faith in Christ. And it is on the basis of that righteousness alone have they been declared righteous by God and found acceptance with God. 
This is clear in the book of Galatians, and this is particularly made clear in Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 5, if you turn there for a moment. And we must begin with what is absolutely clear. Romans 5, verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exult in the hope of the glory. Because we have been justified by faith on the basis of the righteousness of Christ, what do we have? Peace with God. We are reconciled to God. We are no longer under the wrath of God but we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. and not only that we have gained through Christ access by faith into this grace in which we stand we can enter the throne of grace freely and in fact even now we exalt in the hope of the glory of God. Seeing God's glory. The fact that God will come and reveal his glory is no longer dreadful for those who have been justified by faith. It is something that they greatly anticipate and even now greatly rejoice in the prospect of seeing and sharing in that glory. So in a sense, believers are already in possession of this righteousness by faith in Christ. And it is on the basis of that righteousness alone have they been declared righteous by God and found acceptance with God. However, there is also a sense in which believers are still waiting through the spirit by faith of the hope of righteousness. That is the hope which consists of righteousness. For this righteousness is theirs only by continually trusting in Christ and Christ alone for salvation. It is yours but it will only continue to be yours by continually trusting in Christ alone. This righteousness is ours only by continually trusting in Christ alone for our acceptance with God. So there is a sense in which it is also yet a future reality. The best exposition of this is found in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 2 to 11, where Paul gives his own spiritual biography, dealing still with the same kind of errors that the Galatian churches were disturbed by. Paul says in, Galat in Philippians 3 verse 2, Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision. That is the true people of God who worship in the spirit of God. That is how we describe them. And glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. And then Paul expands on that last Two descriptions, glory in Christ, put no confidence in this flesh by giving his own spiritual biography. Verse 4, for although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless, that is, among his contemporaries. 
But whatever things were gained to me, verse 7, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them. It's a present indicative. It's a present reality. And count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness on my own, of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering have been conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul says, not only that this righteousness is already his, and it is, he has been declared righteous by God. He is no longer under the wrath of God. He has peace with God. He has access to God's throne freely because of this righteousness of Christ. And yet, this is his continuing experience as a Christian regarding the works of the law, his own works of the law as contributing nothing. To his justification. He counts them all but rubbish. That I may win Christ. And be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own. Derived from the law. But that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God. On the basis of. In other words, all of his works of obedience, he counts them as nothing. Nothing to contribute to his acceptance with God. And he trusts only in the righteousness God has provided sinners in the person of Christ. That righteousness that is ours by faith. You see, if you believe that righteousness is yours, but the danger is if you shift your faith to something else, you will get, get cut off from Christ. You will be severed from Him. And that's why there is a sense in which this righteousness, Christians are waiting for the hope of righteousness. It's theirs, but they must cling to it. If it is to be theirs in the day of judgment. And this waiting for the hope of righteousness is through the Spirit by faith. As Paul puts it in verse 5, For we, through the Spirit by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. It is the Spirit of God who creates and sustains our faith. And it is by faith that we lay hold of this righteousness that is found only in Christ. It is not through obedience to the law that we hope to finally be justified and accepted by God. It is only through the perfect righteousness of Christ received through faith alone from start to finish. Christian in his deathbed, after all of his works done in obedience, will never trust in them as contributing to his entering heaven. 
but he will only trust in the perfect righteousness of Christ. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness. Now that is the way to stay free. Stay free. Then Paul adds another important perspective concerning this matter in verse 6. Notice what he writes. Under the infallible guidance of the Spirit, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. Circumcision or uncircumcision has nothing to do with our justification. It cannot contribute anything to our justification. You can be circumcised without being justified. A lot of the Jews were circumcised, but were they justified? No. And you can be uncircumcised and still be justified. This right has nothing to do at all with our justification. And that was true even in the case of Abraham, as Paul argues in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 4. And let's bring this into our exposition of Galatians. Romans 4 verse 9. Is this blessing then on the circumcised, that is justification, or on the uncircumcised also? For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised that righteousness might be credited to them. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also who follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. See what Paul is saying? Say, circumcision has nothing to do. It does not contribute to our justification. It has nothing to do with it. You can be circumcised and not justified. You can be uncircumcised and be justified. Circumcision is irrelevant. That was true then. That is true now. Even in the case of Abraham. Even in the case of the Jews. And the people who live under the old covenant, they were believers who were not part of the Mosaic covenant. They were justified. Right? Even under the Mosaic covenant, salvation was not only for those who were under the Jew, the Mosaic covenant, the Jews, but even the Gentiles who were not part of the Mosaic covenant. They were justified. And they were not circumcised. So when it comes to our justification, the issue is not whether you are circumcised or uncircumcised. Justification has nothing to do with that. The issue is and has always been whether you are in Christ or not, whether you have faith in Him or not, that's the issue. Thus Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or circumcision means anything but faith 
working through love. So when it comes to our justification, circumcision or uncircumcision is irrelevant. However, this faith is not a dead kind of faith. It is a living kind of faith. Therefore, it is faith that works through love. You see, faith unites us to Christ, who is the embodiment of supreme Love. It joins us to him who is the embodiment of supreme love. And as Lemsky puts it, how can a heart embrace him who is supreme love without glowing with love and love's energy? The more you trust in Christ, the more Christ will dwell in your heart by faith. And the more Christ will dwell in your heart by faith, the more will you glow in love and love's energy. The expansion of the thought is found in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 to 19. The prayer of Paul for these believers. Christ already dwelt in their hearts, but Paul wants Christ to lay hold that these believers lay hold more of Christ and therefore Christ dwell in them more pervasively. Verse 14 For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through the spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that is dwell more pervasively in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness See what he's saying? The more Christians by the Spirit lay hold of Christ by faith, strengthened by the Spirit in the inner man, the more they are able to lay hold of Christ by faith, the more Christ will dwell in their hearts. And the more they are able to understand the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And the more their souls are filled with God. That they will never feel empty. They will be filled with all the fullness of God. They will glow with love and love's energy. No, that's the way to stay free. That's the way to stay free. And then having considered a call to stay free, the cause of not staying free, the way to stay free, consider with me fourthly and finally in the passage, the final appeal to stay free. And here, it's as if Paul has landed but he's not satisfied yet. He wants to say just a little more before he closed his appeal. We find this final appeal in verses 7 to 12. Let's read verses 7 to 8. Galatians 5 verses 7 to 8. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. The analogy here is that of a race. And this is a common analogy in scriptures of the Christian life. The course of the Christian life is often likened to a race for a price. The Christians in Galatia have 
gotten off in a very good start in the Christian faith. And they have been making very good progress. So who now had hindered them from obeying the truth? And the phrase translated, who hindered you, can also be translated, who cut in on you, which is more expressive. Who cut in in you? The picture is not that of stopping the runners from, but from running, but of throwing them off course. One may run with all his might, but if he gets off course, he is automatically disqualified. It is vital that a runner runs and stay on course. But the Galatian Christians were getting off the course. They have been diverted into a wrong path that leads not to life but death. And they have to get back on course. The source of this persuasion, Paul says, that leads to a diversion does not come from God. Who calls them? It could not be from God. The source must have been sinister or evil. Who cut you off? Then note what Paul adds in verse 9. A little leaven leavens the whole lamp of dough. Here, the little leaven refers to doctrine, not to persons. Teaching. Like leaven, false teaching might seem a small thing compared to the whole body of truth. But like living, once it is admitted into the church or into the heart, it will eventually change the whole character of one's belief and practice. Again, Lenski, and I quote him, he says, The Judaizers were not so foolish as to unload their entire teaching upon the Galatians at one time, they injected it little by little. Paul refers to the little leaven that have already been injected. The fact that the Galatians had begun to observe time, season, chapter 4, verse 10. Although they had not yet, they had not as yet yielded to circumcision. If it is not stopped, that little would eventually leaven and alter. Everything. Remember in Pilgrim's Progress, another graphic imagery by John Bongyan, you follow the narrow way. But because Pilgrim wanted a little comfort because the road, that narrow road was stony sometimes and difficult for the feet, he just left off the straight road just a few degrees to the soft grass. But then you know what happens. The more you walk, even how small the deflection from the straight path before long, you're far and lost. A little leaven leavens the whole lamp of dough. Therefore, there must be no room of admission even of what appears to be just a little error. Precision, particularly in matters essential to the faith, is crucial. You cannot allow just a little error. Or to change the analogy, you say, Ah, that's okay. That milk is fine. Just, just a few drops of cyanide in it. No, it's not gonna work.
There must be no admission, even just of what appears to be just a little error. And that is true when it comes to matters that are essential to the faith. There must be razor edge accuracy. John Calvin, commenting on this, says, Satan's stratagem is, his ways, his method, that he does not attempt an avowed destruction of the whole gospel, but he thinks its purity by introducing false and corrupt opinions. Many persons are thus led to overlook the seriousness of the injury done and therefore make a less determined resistance. The apostle proclaims aloud that after the truth of God has been corrupted, we are no longer safe. He employs the metaphor of leaven, which, however small in quantity, communicates its soreness to the whole mass. We must exercise the utmost caution. Yes, we allow any counterfeit to be substituted for the pure doctrine of the gospel. Isn't that what Rome does? He doesn't deny the gospel. He has secretly introduced errors that taints the gospel and eventually really destroys and denies it. A little leaven, Paul says, you cannot allow the slightest error to enter your heart or enter the church. And then Paul appeals to the Galatians' bias for the truth. Verse 10, I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will adopt no other view. But the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. Since the Galatian Christians are in fellowship with the Lord, they are in the Lord, Paul is confident that the arguments he has given thus far will make them adopt no other view but his. He is confident. They might have been bewitched for a while. Galatians 3 verse 1. But since they are in the Lord, they have the spirit of truth. And therefore, they will be able to distinguish between truth and error. Moreover, since they have a bias for the truth, they will not adopt the view of the errorists or the Judaizers. Paul struck sharp treatment in his Explosive arguments. We'll rid them of the bewitching influence of the Judaizers. He is confident of that. However, the errorist will not be spared by God. He will bear God's punishment. Whoever he is, Paul says, whether he is a pastor, whatever be, his name, whoever he is, God will not spare him. And let the one who introduces false teaching into the church, who break the harmony of the church by false teachings, lend an ear to this word of the apostle. Let them tremble at this word. Those who introduce false teaching into the church will never, never go. Unpunish. Then, as if still not content, Paul appeals on the basis of his own experience. Verse 11. But I, brethren, if I preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? The stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. If Paul were to preach circumcision as a necessary condition or that which is contribute, 
contributory to our justification and acceptance with God, then Paul would have been able to escape persecution from the Jews. And the Judaizers, they would not find the preaching of Paul as offensive. But Paul insisted that Gentiles did not be circumcised in order to be justified and find acceptance with God because he insisted on doing it. He faced very fierce opposition from his own countrymen, the Jews. And why would Paul be willing to face fierce persecution rather than preach circumcision as a condition or that which would contribute to our justification. Well, because the issue is of utmost importance. Paul says, if it is that not serious, why will I not preach it? Why would rather suffer persecution to preach circumcision to, so as to avoid to preach circumcision, to avoid persecution, would be to surrender that freedom that Christ has set believers free. And it is to pervert the gospel of grace. So Paul would rather die, be persecuted, than surrender that freedom. And then note, Paul's closing word in his final appeal, verse 12. I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate or castrate themselves. Ooh. Oh, Paul, that's hard language. Well, that's what he says. If these errorists or Judaizers think that circumcision somehow contributes to our justification, Paul says, then it would be better for them to go all the way of letting themselves be castrated. Now in our effeminate age, that is very offensive language. We don't want to use words that might offend others. So, fornication is labeled sexually active. In fact, uneducated, don't call it ignoramus as one cartoon. Call it intellectually impaired. We don't want to use language that offend anyone. But here Paul says, if these errorists think that circumcision somehow contributes to our justification, it would be better for them to go all the way of letting themselves be mutilated or castrated. Here we find Paul's holy indignation and anger against the errors who were troubling the churches of Galatia. How dare they seek to undermine or pervert the gospel of grace? How dare they disturb the churches of the Lord Jesus if they think that circumcision somehow contributes to their justification it would be better for them to go all the way of letting themselves be castrated. Strong words, right? Yes. But is it out of place? In our effeminate age, yes. But before God, it's not. Remember, we read earlier in Mark 9, 42, Jesus himself said, Whoever causes one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better for him if with a heavy millstone hung around his neck, he has been cast into the sea. That's holy indignation. 
And the problem today of those who find the words of Paul or of Jesus offensive is due to the absence of love for the truth and love for the souls of people. And therefore, the absence of holy anger against error and those who propagate error. If you love the truth and love the souls of men, you will have a holy anger against error and those who propagate error. Although at the same time, you love them. You also hate them. Therefore, in conclusion, for you who are believers in Christ, stay free. Stay free. Be resolute in the freedom in which Christ has given you. Never allow Seventh-day Adventism or Messianic Judaism or Roman Catholicism or whatever ism it might be to subject you again to a yoke of slavery. Be resolute in the freedom that you have in Christ. Stay free. And to you who are strangers of Christ, remember that you will never know true freedom apart from Christ. You'll never know what it means to be free. The Mosaic system cannot make you free. The law of God cannot make you free in itself. Because of our sinfulness. In fact, it can only increase your bondage to guilt and to the power of sin. And nothing can truly make you free. What you need is not more laws, more rules, more festivals, more religious rituals. More information. No. What you need is a person. Christ. The Lord who came to accomplish redemption. Only in him can there be true freedom. Therefore look to Christ. And trust in him alone for salvation. And only then can you really say. I am free. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for our freedom in Christ. We thank you, Lord, that he has done it all for us so that we can enjoy the freedom of being your children. And we pray and ask that, Lord, we will cling to this truth tenaciously, that we will never surrender our freedom, even if it means death. And, Lord, we pray that we will live by the way of staying free. And we pray for those who are strangers of Christ. Help them to see that what they need is your Son, a person, not more laws, not more rules, but Christ and Christ alone to set them free. Hear us and bless your word to our hearts. For these things we plead in Jesus' name.